After this is lunch, comically. So if you're still hungry for some reason, then uh, head out to lunch. Uh, the, the talks resume at 1 o'clock. Um, 2 o'clock is a lock picking intro in the lock picking village. 3 o'clock is the fail of things in the chill out room. I think you guys know all the, all the rest of the stuff by now. So without further ado, um, <laughs> should I call him that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have uh, Deviant Olam and Pinup with Hotel Room Gourmet. Thank you. Thank you, DG. All right, this is, this is going to be weird. Uh, yeah, I am Deve. Some of you met me, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, my wonderful fiance could not be here because she's running a sock this weekend out of town. So standing in just as sexy and almost as good a kisser is Dr. Tran, <laughs> big hand. I decide not to wear lipstick or dye my hair red for today, so. That's all right, we still, we still accept you. So what on earth is this talk? This is, this is literally a talk about getting good food and eating good food. And we're gonna start you right off with the fact that coming up to room temp, we've had some Mancheco cheese here. Please go ahead and grab up, just, we're gonna be coming up and down as we're talking. Just grab cheese, grab little plates. We have a breakdown of that pork. Did we just sear that pork? We did. So if you don't, uh, don't mind digging on swine, we have pork tenderloin medallions up here. They're ready to rock. You should be getting up right now and other people in the front helping me hand this out. Yeah, you come on down. Yeah, if we can just pass, you can just pass the uh, stuff off to the sides. So this aisle cheese, this aisle pork. And this is the kind of stuff we love to eat. We love to eat really good food. A lot of my friends are big into good food as well. It's, this is, there's a lot of names that are, that are on this talk here. So I could not have done this without pinup at all because she and I, we pretty much all we do is cook and read. Um, Babak, Nomad, my buddies from the core group, whenever we're on the road, like we don't eat out a lot. We just, we cook. Uh, DG, DG started my love of steaks and he obviously started layer one here, like just le letting, this, uh, letting this thing green light. He, he gave the thumbs up to that. Vis, Vis is in the audience somewhere, right? Yes, if you follow Vis on Twitter, you already learned a lot more about food than many people. Um, Zach. Bot, Noise, Jack Avigan, all of the rest of Heidi and the hooligans, they, they will debate me endlessly as to whether crispy or flaccid bacon is the appropriate and one true bacon. Crisp, uh, see, this is, a, this is a proper room. I feel very good here. If you've ever been to Jim Manley's like, whiskey tasting, Spam and his brother, they make like pairing dishes. That, like, again, in hotels. This is a lot of people cooking on the road and in hotels. Speaking of drinks, Jack Daniel, a uh, good friend of ours, but he is not here today. We, we will talk to you about some cocktails in his honor. Mitch, I saw Mitch and, and Bonnie somewhere over there, like back in Seattle, some of my best like cooking partners. Trey Ford, another excellent food dude. Beaker is a good food guy. And especially Pinup and I, ever since we were little, like our parents, we, we've been cooking since we were little. We were always allowed in the kitchen. And if you have kids, I strongly encourage that. Dr. Tran is up here and he has been slaving away in my room. If you've been following the Twitter, he and I have been working on this pretty much this whole weekend when we weren't out drinking. So I'm going to start a little bit politically. I'm going to talk about the fact, as many hackers, I, I am kind of a libertarian, right? And a lot of times libertarians get like a bad rap. Like it's the whole, oh, you're just sex and drugs and rock and roll. Like that's, that's all you care about. Like fine, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. If, if, if you don't like sex and drugs and rock and roll, there's something wrong with fucking you. But uh, Tara, you know, pin up my, my fiance. She's, she's like kind of a lefty libertarian. Her, her phrase is, I should be able to take my licensed concealed firearm and shoot anybody who says what I can or can't do with my lady parts. That's her, that's her spin on it. But especially, I wanna have you think about principles of liberty as it relates to food. You know, like the whole partying and drugs and everything and oh, I should be able to put whatever I want into my body, that very libertarian statement, right? A lot of people take that really seriously if they say, oh, well this drug is illegal or no, you can't have alcohol on Sundays in this town in the grocery store. Like, oh, I gotta be able to put what I want in my body. But especially hackers are not the best at putting like food in their bodies. And make no mistake, having the freedom to put what you want in yourself food-wise is something you shouldn't take for granted. So, like, if it, you talk to some people who've had every meal planned for them and they didn't have that liberty, and you'll realize really quickly it matters. And I don't just mean, you know, in the pen, like anyone who's been in the service. Even when you have decent chow, the fact that it's decided for you all the time, the moment anybody has civvy rats come in, like, oh shit, Chef Boyardee, 
where'd you get that stale pizza? Just because it's different. Just because it's something that wasn't slapped down in the mess hall. So being able to make your own choices, being able to decide what you eat is important. It's important on a lot of levels, and I want to kind of inspire you to think about it and be mindful about it. And it's going to apply to health. A lot of, a lot of hackers have gotten way better looking these days, man. Like, I, people have come up to me, like, I've dropped some pounds, but there's, like, Dave Kennedy, if you go to DerbyCon, former Marine. Like, he was cutting hard, man. Then he, civilian life, you know? Civilian life's going to be civilian life. And then he looks like he's dropped some pounds. He's really, you know, he's like TV camera ready. He does interviews now and shit, right? Dan Kaminsky, anybody like Dan's kind of been all over the map in the past. He's looking good. Uh, Joey, like Joey Lost Knowledge, if you do lock picking stuff, like he and his wife Jenny, they were, you know, they were kind of an inspiration to a lot of people. My inspiration was actually Beaker, uh, Chris Hoff. Many people only know him as like this, you know, muscular Brazilian Jiu Jitsu dude. He posted a badge picker, like a picture of his old badge. And I was like, Who, who's that guy in your badge? He's like, oh, that was me. I used to look like that. I was like, damn. So that's what kind of got me inspired. And when you think about it, when you really just take a better interest in what you're eating, you will feel better. You, you, like, you'll enjoy it more. And, you know, it's, I'm not going to, like, lay diet advice on you. There's like, oh, fuck carbs and fuck sugar. Like, that's kind of what I did. But everyone's going to find their own thing is going to work for them. In general, if you're just doing math, like caloric deficit, that's one that, like, the Prez 98, Michael Shearer, he gave a whole talk at Shmukan. He went from, what was it? Does anyone remember? He was, like, 415 pounds, and he is down to 180. And that was over the course of about seven months. And he's like, it's just all caloric deficit. It's just mindful eating. And it's not fucking hard. It's not hard to have control. And remember, just being able to have that freedom to exercise that control over your life is something that you shouldn't take for granted because maybe one day you're going to get too old and you just can't do it anymore. Or maybe one day you're not going to have the economic freedom that you might have with a tech job to be able to eat well. So I want you to think about that and I want you to try it. Pictures of my house, Pinup and I, like this is kind of just how we eat. These are just, you know, these are just our meals. None of these are hard. We just love to sit and cook together. We sit and cook and read by the fire and go to bed. Like, cooking is what we got. And every one of these, you'll see, like, you know, there's a lot of meat that shows up. There's a lot of veg. Those are edamame noodles, by the way. If you want low-carb, high-protein noodles, you can have pasta. We rework a lot of stuff. So, like, previous meats from other meals. This is just a lunch one day, a little, like, squash soup and some meat from last night little chopped salad, put little pomegranate arrows in your salads. It's going to blow your fucking mind. But I'm not just laying recipes on you up here, right? Like, I eat a lot of meat, and we're going to eat a lot of meat. How was the pork, by the way? Did anybody try it? Is it all right? Sweet. How was the cheese? These are, these are not, like, all this stuff is just Costco and cooked in the room. You're going to do all this. So, you know, we've got, we've got a nice steak. We've got some veggies. We've got some sweated leeks here. I love steak, and you will all eat a lot of steak during this talk. But be, be aware, like, steak is not by itself a meal. It's, there's that old joke on uh, the TV show Mad Men where they were trying to come up, they're advertising, and they're trying to come up with cocktails for, like, 7-Up was their new client. And they're like, hmm, how about this, 7-Up and vodka. Hmm, rocket fuel, jet fuel, rocket fuel. And, you know, their boss, she's like, yeah, that's, okay, I'm coming back and I want 10 drinks, and they all have to have three ingredients. Two, two ingredients is not a cocktail, it's an emergency. So, like... Steak is not a meal. This is good, but this is not a meal, right? This is a meal. Adding a little bit more to it, adding a little more to the plate, having some other colors. This is, again, getting back to health. You will be more satisfied when you eat. If you, many of you might know this. The more colors and textures are on your plate, you're going to feel fuller sooner. You're going to really, you're going to, I'm trying to change the way you're going to enjoy your time in your kitchen, man. If you, don't, if you don't dig on chow, like steak, tasty, not a meal. Steak, some carrots, instantly a meal, easy to make. Most of all though, share food with others. And that's why I'm really thrilled that you're here today and I'm really thrilled that we're gonna be sharing food with you this whole time because if you're with friends, you're gonna like it more, you're gonna eat more slowly and you're just gonna feel way more satisfied with everything you have. Now this is great when I'm home, but like I'm on the road a lot. Uh, Pinup is on the road even more than me. And now that whenever we can, we just travel together. So we're constantly in another city. We're probably only home about 20% of the time these days. But we still want to eat. Like, we still want to eat the way we eat. It's our thing, right? So this is a meal that we just threw together at a friend's house. We're like, hey, can we use your kitchen? We're going to make you dinner. Boom. We just knock that together. This is me and the guys at my company. We're, like, at some shitball Airbnb right near the Pentagon. You can see it doesn't even have enough silverware. There's, like, my knife, and there's, like, a kitchen knife, and trying to make dinner settings. 
another, another craptastic Airbnb somewhere. I'll always go for the Airbnbs just to have a kitchen. Or when you don't have a kitchen, this is a hotel room. This is me sitting on a bed having like chicken and veg. This is me having steak, like watching Murder, She Wrote or something or Mythbusters in the hotel. This is steak that I literally made in the hotel bathroom, just like right there on the sink. So, and I sometimes have too much though. Like this was in a sky club as I was leaving a con. I just had so much extra food that I'd made. I was just, it was like in my bag and I'm just giving it out in the sky club. Everyone I ran, I ran into Grifter. I ran into like Dave Shackelford. I'm just like, here, you want meat? Here you go. Meat Santa is here. So you can do everything um, you're seeing up here. Every one of these dishes, it's not out of the reach for you. Even if you've like, oh my God, I just never learned to cook. You can absolutely execute all of this stuff and we're gonna give you some tips and pointers, and we're gonna let you try it. So, food is great, but do we open, we open that wine, right? Can I get a glass of that wine, please? Because we're gonna start with a quick thing about drinks, because food should be paired with good drinks. I can talk forever about whiskey. Uh, as I said, like, I've kind of cut carbs and sugar. I don't drink beer anymore, I miss it a little bit, but like, I'll taste a beer, like you had that bottle party vis, and I would t try a little thing, but I haven't had like an evening drinking beer in four or five years. Uh, just, you gotta make hard choices, right? But like, wine, very little carbs. Whiskey, no carbs. No net carbs at all. We got more wine, because we're gonna have steak. If you want some wine, we can hook you all up. So, bourbon, I can talk forever about. Some of my favorites, they're on the list. You can, you can ask me a lot of different questions about bourbon. I drink a lot of scotch, all different, I like really peaty scotches. I like Islas, so Oddbeg, Lefroig. Red wine, as we have here, perfectly acceptable thing to pair with your meals. I'm a big proponent of, of alcohols, but if you want to make a sweet cocktail, and we're going to be doing this later in the chill out area, and I was making them the other night, I've never been a rye whiskey person. Like, I would try a taste of rye, and Rogue Clown is a friend of ours, she loves rye, and I'm like, oh man, this is never, doesn't quite work with me. Until I had a Sazerac. Has anyone ever had a Sazerac cocktail? Oh boy, let me tell you, man, this is, this is some classy as fuck shit. And if you can get behind making it, it's a little harder than, than some drinks, but essentially, it is a perfume-heavy experience. You're using a type of bitters that is very, very medicine-y flavored, Peychaud's bitters. You're using an absinthe rinse in the glass. So we can, we can make these later. Sometimes, I did them last time on stage. I'll do them in the chill-out room later. It's, it's a fun little, like, it's a little <laughs> flourish. And it's, it, learn to make one, like, knock it together, I don't even use sugar in mine, I just, a couple drops of Splenda, don't throw rocks at me. But it's gonna, it'll knock you on your ass, it just blows your taste buds away. Learn to make a Sazerac, and you can just sit all night long just sharing that with others. Now you need a lot of ingredients, right? You need interesting advanced ingredients. This is Jack Daniel's hotel room. Like, he makes a lot of, if you've ever had Jack make you cocktails, dude knows what's up. But he drives everywhere. Uh, I can't do that, I fly. So I made, you know, Sazerac's on the road. I'm like, here I am at Shmoocon, and like CP, if he's in the room, I'm just, I'm throwing these at him as he's like playing Hack Fortress. So how do I do that? Well, I have a little road kit. Just little tiny bitters bottles, and a little, you know, bit of sweetness, and a channel knife, and this is me like making it in the Delta Sky Club. I even made a super tiny one that fits in my backpack on the plane. So when I'm, again, I'm in the air a lot, and I drink too much. But I'm like, hey, bartender, can I get a ride? No, I'll take it from here. And the, you know, the Sky Club staff knows me as the guy who makes my own cocktails. So if you're gonna like host a room party, if you're gonna have eating well on the road, right? Let's go with our drinks list. Learn to make a Sazerac. Learn to make an old-fashioned if you want. That's another excellent cocktail. Yes, sir. Are you just thumbs, thumbs upping that? Yes, absolutely. If you can make a couple cocktails, the rest of the time, simple shopping, right? So bourbon, like I said, we can talk forever about bourbon. My absolute favorite bourbon, Four Roses Single Barrel. I know you're, it's like, what, Four Roses? Yes, trust me, try it. This or the small batch, but especially the single barrel, knock you on your ass. Bullet, if you're on a budget, usually revered as one of the best bang for your buck bourbons. Like, I can talk forever about bourbon. Like, Chris and I, just, we'll just go to town. Rye, if you're making that Sazerac, get a bottle of rye. Rittenhouse is my home of Pennsylvania. Well, now it's made by Heaven Hill in Kentucky, but Rittenhouse rye, excellent rye. You're on a budget bullet to the rescue again. If you want to have like scotch in the room for people who don't know what they like, just like blended scotch. It's like, you know, in fine dining, they say chicken is what people want when they don't know what they want. Like bullshit scotch is what people want when they don't know what they want. So throw a bottle of that in there. No one's going to bitch. I love, you know, smokier scotches, peatier scotches. Pin up, she's a space side gal, so she'll get a lot of Glenfiddich going on. 
If you are getting into scotch and you want to get good scotch, but you're a little hesitant, look for milder and lighter flavored Highlands. Get a Glenmorangie, get an Aberfeldy. They're going to do interesting things without completely nuking your palate, and you might get into it that way. If you're making that Sazerac, you're probably not going to find absinthe in uh, your like liquor store. You may have to just bring it with you, and we'll talk about traveling with liquor. You can use like Pernod in a uh, in a pinch. You know, you're going for an anise. You're not going for a licorice flavor. Many people think of absinthe as licorice. Like I'm in the sandbox a lot, and I'd come back with like arak or raki, and I tried to use it once in a Sazerac. Did not work. Don't don't try to do that. Peixos bitters. You're probably Amazoning for that as well, just because you're not going to find that at a local liquor store. Yes, DG. Anisette, anisette. Yes, anisette, sir. Thank you, thank you, Italy. And like I said, um, it's not not like doctrine, but I don't use sugar in any cocktails. So just one drop of Splenda syrup is enough to be like a whole sugar cube. Wine, by the way, fun story about wine. There is an app. It's called Vivino. If you're a beer person, you maybe people talk about Untapped. It's like Untapped for wine. What's cool about it, though? is there's this little camera feature that Chris and Amanda, friends of ours, they're like, hey, this game we play in a store. We go into a store, take out the camera mode, and there's a little slider right down here at the bottom. You see the little slider? You go, boop, and it's multi-bottle mode. So they'll pick like a price point. They'll be like, all right, $12 or less, go. And they'll just run down the aisle and be like, bah, just scanning as many bottles as they can. And I found a 3.9, I found a 4.1, and like, who can find the best wine for like super cheap? It's, it's, it amuses me. I, I definitely have found things that I wouldn't have otherwise drank. So we love them and I appreciate hearing about that. Traveling with this stuff, by the way. So buying wine locally, sure. But if you want to travel with it, there are these products. They're called Vino, I'm sorry, they're called Vino Lock bags or Wine Wings bags. You can find these online. They're, I've never had a bottle of wine or liquor break in my luggage. They're super cheap. They're really useful. They're double seal, like I love these. If you're making uh, cocktails, don't forget lemons. I always like, oh shit, forgot the lemons. Then I gotta go raid the hotel staff. But that's enough about drinks. On to food, because we're here for food, right? So, shopping list. I'm gonna put all the slides up online, but like, this is what we do every time we bomb into town. We hit a grocery store, first thing you go for, eggs. Oh my god, if you wanna just live cheap and well on the road, like you're trying really hard to be healthy, you basically can do it on eggs. Eggs and whiskey is kind of, I can live on that. Does it matter if eggs are brown for health purposes? No, it does not. Um, many people, oh, the brown eggs, they're so good for you. No, what the chicken is eating de determines that. What does matter, I'm not going to get too hippie on you here, but like I go for organic eggs when I can. Organic does actually, in my opinion, taste better. It, uh, it is more healthy in some ways. That is the only regulated term on a carton of eggs. So like free range, grass fed, college educated chickens. Those are all like, none of those terms are legally enforceable. Organic is the only thing that really matters if you go for that. You were saying about how people get way into their organic eggs though, right? They're like, well, this is, look at this egg that I made and it looks better, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of myths out there about how you can tell whether an egg is organic. You'll sometimes see those memes on the internet where they po point out how the egg yolk is slightly gray or green. And, oh, this is how you can tell. That's complete BS. That, it just means you overcooked your eggs. Yeah. And there are a lot of, if, if you like really are getting into your food sourcing, there are a lot of tiny farms maybe where you live that could be producing organic eggs, but the, so many small like farmers, they can't pay to have the certification. So, wow, I, I, I am a Philadelphian who's definitely a Seattleite now. I'm talking like a, a more Northwesterner. Like, yes. So the yolks being darker and more in, in organic eggs, I've sometimes seen what I might call a bolder color of yolk. Um, again, I think a lot of that is more dictated by the, what the, the chicken is eating. In many cases, it's going to be a better food source in an organic egg. Yeah, I think it has to do with the diet of the chickens, because when I lived in Europe, the yolks were actually orange, not yellow. Um, and I think it's just the way they raise the chickens and what they feed them. Steak. Buy a lot of steak. I eat a lot of steak. I always buy ribeye. End of story, because pinup's not up here to disagree with me. Fuck everything else. Dairy, like I don't avoid dairy. Um, I will definitely eat like full fat Greek yogurt whenever I can. Because low fat yogurt, if you actually look at it, there's just more shit in it. It's more sugar usually in low fat yogurt. So I'll go for that. Cheese, I'll eat plenty of cheese. You, cheese is not bad, no matter what you were told when you were little, I think. And by the way, it could change your life right here. Irish fucking grass fed butter. 
If you have just like bullshit butter in your house, get it the fuck out of there, dude. Oh my God, this will, the flavor of this, in fact, what we're gonna finish the steaks in is a clarified version of this. And yeah, it's gonna knock you on your butt. So again, like we're in a hotel. You can usually get a fridge. You're gonna need that for some of this stuff. How do you get a fridge in a hotel that charges? Yes, well, you could, somebody said diabetes. You could just say, I have medicine that needs to be refrigerated. They're always gonna think it's insulin. And they're like, oh, we'll send that up. I'm like, my assistant didn't book this the right way. Like, uh, and like, if you have a complete shitty hotel, you can make a prison fridge. Like, drape a couple towers over that. It'll work. Yeah, it'll, it'll do the job. That's just fine. You're only in town for a few days. Fruit and veg, sure. Keep you regular, get you some fiber. My main thing is avocados. How do you tell an avocado wo from an avocado no in the store, right? Because you want, you want a nice green avocado. You don't want, you don't want this brown bullshit. Yep, I'm seeing the thumb moves, yes. So the little, little nub on there, you want to pick avocados out of the bin that feel right, but still have the nub. Pop the little nub off, it's like a porthole into the avocado. Bright green underneath means the avocado is bright green inside. Brown underneath means you're getting brown on the inside. Giving you pearls here. Yeah, avocado, paprika, salt, pepper, maybe a little McCormick seasoning, like bam. Another mind blower. Dump a little bit of that Greek yogurt in the middle of the avocado and then just like, that's the sound of the erection striking the table that you're sitting in front of. <laughs> Absolutely. Salt, pepper, lemon, yes sir. Yes, anything spicy, so I'll use like spicy peppers and things, by all means, like this, again, you can, you will, you will change your mornings, man. Fuck shitty breakfast. Avocado. Fruit and veg? Yeah, who cares? Sometimes I eat them. I don't as much anymore. Like, bananas are stupid cheap for geopolitical reasons of history, but they're also kind of sugary. If you have a microwave, I love me some frozen edamame. Big grain sea salt on that. Oh, yeah. If you have a stove, like maybe you're in an Airbnb, or maybe you travel with a stove that we'll talk about. Get some veg, you can, make, you can knock that out. Get some aromatics too, like we'll use a little onion and things that we're making. The mush we have steakhouse mushrooms up here. They were made with, with onion and garlic. And wine. and wine, that's right. We did a little deglazing with the wine. I don't do a lot of packaged goods shopping when I'm, when I'm on the road, really. Like maybe I'll get a can of like fish, uh, maybe some Epip or Quest bars, nuts. Nuts are kind of healthy. But if you've ever heard of like shop the edges of the grocery store, that's, that's how a lot of you know, the times Pinup and I hit a grocery store. So already, without even like cooking, we're eating better than most people can on the road. Like this was, you know, pin up, we were at DerbyCon and she like, she's like, come upstairs, you've been drunk all morning and you haven't eaten anything, come upstairs. So she just had this spread. And again, just like the visual, right? Different colors, different textures. I just cried when I was like, oh my God, this is why I'm marrying you. This is just lovely. So you can make things look appealing. You can like that little cheese board we just knocked together. Like this was, you know, this was just a little party we were hosting. Spread out the avocado, spread out the cheese. This thing was like decoration in a hotel room that I just dumped whatever was on it and wiped it off. And I was like, yay, room party, right on. Make cocktails, have nuts. In the uh, grocery store, I do recommend, uh, by the way, that you get like you know some paper towels and things. I have had hotel rooms that look like back alley abortions have happened in them because I didn't have paper towels. So I feel really bad for those towels. If you have an Airbnb, don't forget the Cascade. Use that, use that dishwasher that you're paying the extra amenity fee for. But this is pretty much it. This is your shopping list to do everything and more. And there's some other stuff we travel with. We'll talk about it. And this looks expensive, right? Like, oh my God, am I really going to go to like all this trouble each time? You always come out ahead. If you get into this and you're with people, you're always going to come out ahead on money. I think, how many people we got in here eating? We're going to have like 50 people in this room? We're probably going to feed everyone in this room for less than 20 bucks a head. And it's going to be like a couple of really solid offerings. That includes all the booze. You always come out ahead if you're buying your food. So, you're all stocked up? All right, let's talk about some recipes. I said eggs are the staple, right? Because you can always find eggs, even if there's no grocery store. Like one time I walked to some like shit ass gas station, the kind that has like drug paraphernalia and copied porn. That gas station, fucking carton of brown eggs down there next to the old English 800. In a hotel, like I've walked down to the kitchen late at night, just, you know, wandered around like, hey, I huevo saqui, like, you know, like you just, I've just asked, like, I was like, I'll give you money, and the guy just gave me eggs. Uh, by the way, another tip, you're going to urban explore a hotel. What is the best accessory that you can have with you? Flashlight, no. Knife, no. Every hotel has one for you when you arrive. Ice bucket. You want to walk around places you don't belong, take off your shoes, wear like your pajamas, carry that ice bucket. Act tired. 
I have been in so many weird service corridors and things. It was like, oh, man, ice machine on four is not working. Like, you know, the, get out of here, kid. I've never gotten in trouble. Been all over a fucking hotel. Now, I got some built-in privilege, right? And I'm very aware of this. But, like, I look pretty innocent, you know? Take off your shoes if you're in a pinch. Like, I was, I was in an elevator machine room once, and, uh, cause like, why not? It was late and I wanted to explore. And I could hear outside the door, like, radio squelch from security, cause I must have hit a door sensor. And I was like, oh shit, this is not gonna go well. And they're like, they can't get in, cause like, they don't have keys to the elevator room. So I'm like, all right, well I got my ice bucket. So I just kinda kicked my shoes off into a dark corner, and I just burst through the door. And they're like, huh. And I was like, hey, where is the goddamn vending area? Like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be in there. I'm like, I know I'm not supposed to be in there. Door was open. Uh, uh. And I'm a dude with no shoes and an ice bucket. Like, I look innocent. So eggs. Uh, Pinup, if she were here, would talk much more. She is the magician of eggs. We have, like, at tour camp, there was a cooking contest, and the theme was eggs. And, like, we just, we freaking annihilated it. We almost won. Like, Pinguino wins every year. So getting second to Pinguino, we thought was a win. Because, again, Tara, she is, like, the queen of eggs. Me... I hard boil a lot of eggs. Hard boiled eggs, some salt, pepper. Again, like I've lived on hard boiled eggs in my hotel room and a bottle of whiskey for like many more days than I should. Every hotel room can hard boil eggs. What's the thing in the hotel room you can use? There we go, yes. You can do hard boiled eggs in a coffee maker. I don't recommend it. It's really slow and laborious and it's a pain in the ass. Uh, I'd say go on Amazon, get this, oh my God, my room is on fire thing and like, you know, 12 bucks. Well, how do you hard boil eggs with this? We already said, what does every hotel room have? Has the ice bucket, boom, insulated, there you go. Peel them, clean them, bag them up, eat them the rest of the week. Eat them every morning instead of the shitty, like you're at a meeting hall and like, they're, oh, here's, here's all your bagels. No, just salt, pepper, St. Lucifer pepper. St. Lucifer pepper from my home of Philly, very nice stuff. Or if you know this, if he, you still every now and then come out with your pepper powders. Yeah, dangerous, dangerous stuff here. Be careful, it's, this is not for, not for weaklings, but yeah, spicy, like, and then you know, dress them up, make deviled eggs. I've made deviled eggs out of hard boiled eggs in like the airport. Found a restaurant with some packets of mustard, you know, I'm in a sky club, they have free deviled eggs, in the, or free hard boiled eggs in the sky club. Mash them up, fill them up, there you go, yay, done. And uh, cause a lot of sky clubs will have a bar. You can get Tabasco sauce at a bar, you know, spice up your deviled eggs. Cause deviled eggs are supposed to be hot and spicy. If you're not making them spicily, you're doing it wrong. This is probably my favorite deviled egg recipe. I know it's hard to read. They're going to be in the slides. Zip and zap. A lot of, like, a lot of good zippy notes. Eggs, eggs all the way. So I'm a big advocate of eggs, and hopefully now you are too. By the way, you can like batch process the fuck out of eggs, right? There, you, you get enough people, and this was just before tour camp, we're just prepping a ton of eggs. Now, by the way, we're not on a stove, though. How are we cooking these eggs? Ah, this is, this is the meat of what, literally the meat of what we're doing. Sous vide cooking. How many people do know what sous vide cooking is? How many people do not? All right, it's a little bit of a mix there. Most of you have seen this before. If you haven't, this is, this is the thing, right? Cooking is chemistry. Cooking is science. At various temperatures, certain operations will happen. Certain chemical reactions will happen to your food. Now, when you are cooking, think about like if you could set, you know, you're like, I'm gonna set my oven to this amount of temperature. Yes, you're gonna get this particular operation, right? So this is, what is it? Bone collagen becomes soluble at 136. But you're also gonna get all of these operations that became at a lower temperature. You get up to that point. And if you change to a different temperature, you're gonna get all of these operations. And this also applies with across time. The longer you run, certain operations of, of chemical reaction will run longer. What's hard in most types of conventional cooking is precision. So for the longest time, humanity would just like, oh, I got this, this meat, I wanna cook it. All right, put it over fire. Is the fire anywhere near the spectrum of those temperatures I just listed? No, it's way effing hotter. And the heat is going through air to get to the meat. Is air a good conductor of temperature? No. This is a really inefficient process that's gonna burn one side, blow out the moisture. Like it's very easy to overcook food in conventional means. You wind up with you know, a piece of shoe leather. Now, you know, industrial revolution and processes, we, we do have metal cooking implements, but again, you're exposing the food to a much higher heat source. Now it's going through the metal, which is, is metal a good conductor of, of thermal energy? It is, but the heat is still way too high. <laughs> 
very, very easy to overdo your food. And it's, get, it's very frustrating if you just ruin your meat, right? So sous vide cooking is a water bath process. In fact, we even have, uh, we have the giant you know, cooler over there. This is what we cooked everything in that you're, that you're tasting. You, what you do is you use a very low bit of heat, a very, very controlled heat. You agitate the water, you stir the water so it's evenly distributed. Your food goes in the water. Now you're not boiling it. You're not boiling, we didn't just throw steak in the water, you put the food in a container. The food is in a container in the water which is very precisely thermally controlled. Is water a good conductor of, en of energy? Yes, the food will hit a temperature, stay at that temperature for as long as you want. It's like magic. It, it is like the most magic way of unfuck upable cooking. Now it takes longer, so that's the thing you just have to plan for, right? But if you got time, like you can, you can read, you can fuck right off and leave. Like the meat is just going to do its thing. And by the time you come back, everything is just perfectly done. It's done all the way through, edge to edge, and it is very, very satisfying. Now you do have to do a finished process. We'll talk about why. You're going to brown the outside to get what's called a Maillard reaction, and it's. Boom. It's just there. Do we want to uh, start turning over some steaks in the pan? Hopefully we won't set off any smoke alarms here. So what we have is a bunch of ribeye that we've done for a, about 28 hours now, I guess. Yeah, 28 hours. So these are going to be pretty rare because medium rare and rare is how your steak should be. I, I usually have my steak blue, um, but you know I realize that's not for everybody, so I'm trying to be accommodating here. Using like sous vide stuff is not outrageous. It used to be that like it was called an immersion circulator in big commercial kitchens. They would be a, like a giant, look like the size of a deep fryer, right? You have this big water bath and this you know heater unit. But people are like, hey, why? We don't have to sell this massive thing. If, if consumers want this at home, why not just sell the little heating element and then have it stir the water? So con consumer grade, home grade culinary t tools like this, culinary home culinary immersion circulators are a thing, and they become very popular. So some glory shots of stuff you can do with it. This is the last thing we're gonna make today. This is the first time I tried sous vide cooking. I just bought like a four finger bone-in ribeye. Got it out on the counter at home, put it in a bag, put the bag in the water, 126 dungarees of freedom, pull it out, bam, 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 in the cast iron. This is what we got. Looks like a nice steak. Let's look at the inside. <clears throat> this was the first time I ever tried it. It is almost unfuck upable, and it is just, it's, it's a dream. It's a really nice way to rock and roll, man. So we pretty much sous vide everything now. Uh, for Christmas dinner, you know, my buddy Mitch I was referencing, he did like standing prime rib roast. Again, you, this is probably $150 worth of meat. You don't want to F this up. Turns out he did not. This is a sous vide process, like restaurant grade, supreme, excellent eating. You can all do this. There's a lot of apparatus. We're going to talk about which ones we got, and as we do, we'll keep, it, we'll keep this going on here. We're going to hopefully, let's see if this is loud. Yeah, you can still hear me. Yes, sir, question. What's the trade-off for quality when you're doing the consumer and when you're doing the, like, the professional? Like, the trade-off, this question is what's the trade-off between consumer versions of sous vide hardware and like the, the commercial grade? Usually, you're just talking about um, heating element strength and run cycle. So a consumer version might take longer to heat up uh, a bit of water. Um, and sometimes they're not rated for quite as much runtime or on-off cycles as, as something you'd see in a commercial kitchen. But I've, I've never killed any of my, has anyone actually had like a home unit die on them? Well, you almost did. You, what happened to you that one time? So I decided to use a pot as my water vessel and I didn't have a lid on it. So I, I was cooking, I think it was pork belly or steak or something for 48 hours. So basically the humidity, there was so much humidity in my kitchen that it shorted out the sous vide cooker. So the easy solution for that was just to wrap the, the top with foil, so that way the, the, the moisture will be captured inside the vessel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, preventing thermal spill we'll talk about later. Uh, some of the units, like, so if people early, early on got into this, PolyScience, that was one of the first names that they were a commercial product. They started making uh, you know, culinary products for the average consumer. A lot of us have Anovas, the first Anova generation. A lot of us you'll see in a lot of people's kitchens, Tran and I both have the Anova Culinary. I love it. It's, it works really, really well. Sansaire, just another competitor. They, they make a nice unit. They make a new one called the Delta, which is just a smaller shape, a little more, a little more horsepower. The Jewel, man, if you want like the smallest package and a very high-end heating element, the Jewel is what some people go for. Uh, Chef Steps is a website for like home cooks, and they, this was a Kickstarter of theirs. 
The only, uh, down, like it's beautiful, compact, sealed package, it's really well made, it has basically no external controls. It's only controlled via an app. So if, you, if you're okay with that, it's the smallest one, but like in this room, there's a lot of, yeah, you could, there's some weird shit you could probably do, right? But there's a lot of different gear out there, and they all are very, very precision controlling this water bath. So like, with the eggs, okay, sous vide egg recipe, we're gonna do this later. You're gonna all do this with me. This meal you see right now, and Pinup and I are having breakfast in this shot, these are, the best way I can describe it, they are like egg custard. Like if you've had flan in like a Spanish restaurant, imagine a flan that doesn't have sugar, that has no carbs, that is savory and has like bacon and cheese in it. That's what this is. This is what our, this has become our breakfast every day now, all the time. Most people like breakfast, fucking terrible. Like grow up, you know, you grow up eating cereal before school. It's just all carbs and you dump sugar on it or who the hell knows what. Or a cereal bar, cause like it wasn't shitty enough before, right? Like these, every breakfast mix shake thing, like lol at this bullshit. What is the, f 41 grams of fucking carbs? I will puke if I have this in the morning. Egg cups. How many of you got a little egg, got a little glass jar? How many of you still wanted one? Are there any more up there? We might have given them all out. This is what you're going to do. And we're going to do this in the breakout room after this talk. The reason you have all these. Making these little flan egg type custards is so simple. You get a bunch of toppings that you'd like in eggs. I've got bacon bits with me. I've got diced onions with me. I've got a lot of cheese with me. We might have some mushrooms left over. You name it. It's like making a taco bar. You spread all this out. You then take a dozen eggs and a, I want to say it's a pint? No, it's a cup. A cup of heavy cream. Put it in the blender, whip that shit. <laughs> take your cups and fill them about a third of the way up with any toppings you like in eggs. Anything you would like in an omelet or like in scrambled eggs. Fill them up. Get your cups ready. Pour your egg, your egg cream whip over it. Little, these are little ball jars. These are little like canning jars, right? So finger tight with the lids, label them, you know, like everyone put your names on them so you know whose is whose. Put that in at 170 degrees freedom, give it about 90 minutes. They are now going to be fully cooked through in this beautiful creamy kind of consistency. They're gonna all seal. So if you, I don't know if you've ever done like, I'm this kid on a farm and so was Tara, like you can do canning. Like you take these out, you put them on the counter, you hear them all pop. They get locked in, they're gonna be pasteurized, sealed for weeks, they'll keep, and then you're just ready to rock. These are a minute in the microwave, bam, every morning. It's, it's so fucking good. Um, this is inspired by Starbucks, like those egg shot things they're making now. People have tried, and they're way better than the ones at Starbucks. They are incredibly tasty. So this is what we live on, like for every morning, boom, boom, boom. And you know, they're perfectly transportable. Turns out the TSA says they are not liquid or gel. I have taken these into airports a lot. <laughs> I had to explain it a few times. They're like, what, eggs? I'm like, no, trust, because I just turned it upside down. I'm like, doesn't come out, it's fine. Not a gel. Um, when, you, uh, when you do sous vide cooking, there are other bits of hardware that you might want. Obviously, you can see a lot of fun happening on this side of the stage. How's, let's, let's, let's go like cooking show. How's that, how's that steak looking there, sir? Good. Sweet. So other things you might want when you're using a sous vide setup. Some people will use a vacuum sealer because, you know, the food has to go in a bag, right? Vacuum sealer is nice to have, not mandatory. Uh, if you're long-term storing, if you're prepping a ton of meat at once, I'll use a vacuum sealer at home. I don't travel with it. I used to. Nowadays, for the most part, Ziploc bags are fine. So get a Ziploc bag. You can immerse it in the water, or I will, like, draw a cocktail straw of air out of it. That'll seal it up. Speaking of immersing it, you need a vessel of some kind, right? Every hotel's got a sink. It might, like, drain a whole bunch, and you're refilling it all the time, so that's a pain in the dick. I will usually just go to any shitbird store and find a bucket. Because again, the vessel doesn't matter. The vessel never touches the food. I have left so many five gallon buckets in hotel rooms and puzzled so many maids, I'm sure. <laughs> because they're cheap, they're abundant, they're always gonna work. Sometimes, again, you're steaming off a lot of temperature. You're fighting that thermal spill. But yeah, like five gallon bucket works fine. This is like a foot bath, because like, who gives a damn? It's not touching the food. Getting a lot of food in here, it'll all fit in. You don't have to like leave a ton of room for the water. The only thing having more water buys you is greater thermal regulation if you put a ton of meat in. Like, it'll hold its temperature better as opposed to fighting its way back up to temperature. But you don't need, it's not like a, a fish tank. You don't need enough room for the, like, everyone to have their own little personal space. You can jam it all in there, it's gonna get to temperature. 
tiny ass container on my desk at the office because I wanted a steak one day. You can use, you can use a cooler. Some people like using a cooler because you're not fighting that thermal spill as much. It's going to hold heat in, carve a little hole in it. That'll work. Every grocery store is going to have something, even if you're, you know, you just, you didn't travel with anything except your, like, one immersion circulator. You can find a vessel, right? You're like, again, it doesn't matter what the vessel is. Just buy it, leave it there, four dollars later. Pelican cases are watertight. That works. All of our luggage is Pelican cases. We just did that once because, fuck it, why not? It works fine. Speaking of styrofoam, by the way, if you're trying to do really high temperature work, so chicken is going to be a little bit higher temperature than steak, um, vegetables are going to be much higher temperature than any meats, it's really a struggle to keep the water bath up around 180, 190 doing vegetables, unless you have an insulated container. So, you know, by the way, if you're doing multiple foods, like we did that pork and we did the steak and everything else, what you do is you do your highest temperature food first. Like in this case, we have chicken and, and, and veg, right? So you prep all your meat, you prep all your vegetables, you do the vegetables first at the very high temperature. Then once they're done, like, all right, it's been 90 minutes, throw some ice cubes in there, bring it down to like meat temperature and start running the meat. Now the veg is just gonna hang out. It, the vegetables don't care that they're in like 160 or 140 degree water, they're cooked. They're staying warm. So you can stack your progress and it's not gonna overshoot. So yeah, absolutely, like do, like this would have been chicken first, then followed by pork, then followed by all that steak. This is the chart. This is the chart of all charts. You will get this in the slides if you want later. You will dial in whatever you want to do. It is definitely executable. All of our steak here was done very rare. I actually do mine way down at 126, uh, but it's fine, it's healthy. Because actually, if you, don't, if you don't know this, like first of all, it's very hard to get sick from very good meat. Um, proper meat is gonna be, are we gonna start breaking these down up here in a minute? Yeah. Cutters, we need cutters, we need choppers. So if you have good quality meat, any contaminant on that's gonna be surface contamination just from handling and packaging. It's not gonna be in the flesh of the animal. And if you bring to temperature, anything over 126 is basically microorganisms can't reproduce. That is, that starts to be the death zone. 160 is essentially instant kill for any, any like contaminant. That's why they always say, bring chicken to 160. I'll be honest, I don't. I don't bring my pork to 160, I don't, bring my, I don't like it, the taste of it. Because it's not an all or nothing. It's not like, everything's infected and bam, it's gone. No, as you start ramping up the temperature, any microorganisms, are, there's gonna be a slow die off. And if you're rolling at 126 or 127 for more than 90 minutes, you've essentially started to pasteurize everything in there. So I don't really worry about this kind of stuff the way some people do. You can see chef temp is like the USDA recommended. I don't, I don't do that. I get pretty bold with my temperature push. One more note, speaking of temperatures and styrofoam. Styrofoam is not watertight. Styrofoam will osmote a little bit of water, little by little. And you'll see, like I had this set up in a, this was in an Airbnb in like Honolulu and just, that countertop looks nice and shiny. It's not beautiful linoleum, it's literally water is just everywhere because it's slowly leaked out of the styrofoam. So be aware of that. I like using a cooler, a proper cooler. If you have a, a hole saw, like if you, like you install a deadbolt, go figure, the lock guy has lock installing tools. Um, yeah, a hole saw, boom, right through it. And like, this is what I use all the time now. This is what we used on our giant cooler. I strongly recommend it, even on the road. So let me see, my slides are being a little bit clicky there. Let's see. How's that stay? Is it coming down? Is it coming breaking down? There we go. So yes, having a nice vessel, being able to rock out on the road, this, this is again, like this is not hard. You can take crappier meat and make it great. This is not high-end steak. This is just a break to, oh, did we do the tri-tip yet? Oh, we have not done the tri-tip. Oh yeah, so we got tri-tip over here. We're gonna warm that up before the ribeye comes out. I just, I'll take like tri-tip and just break it up into tiny pieces. So we're gonna just, we're gonna wake those back up in the pan in a minute. Chicken, resting with a little bit of that grass-fed butter. This is the tri-tip that I broke down in a hotel room. Because again, like you can get cheap meat and do it longer and slower and it will break down, it will tenderize the meat. You did, the first time ever, wh how was the long, we did the steaks for at your house, uh, what was that? 48 hours. He did a 48 hour ribeye cook for dinner the other night. Uh, and it was, it was unbelievable. You almost didn't need utensils. The meat just like fell apart and it was, gl it was glorious. So take a humongous load of cheap tri-tip, break it out into steaks and feed everyone in the goddamn room. Seasoning your meat, you can season it before it goes in the bag. All different ways to do that. There's a bunch of recipes online. 
I am a little leery of too much salt in the bag because salt's going to pull out moisture of the meat. A lot of people put plenty of salt in. I just, I, most of these steaks, they're going to just have some bay leaf and a lot of pepper. Uh, DG giving me the advice long ago of a little bit of lemon pepper, a little bit of black pepper, kind of like steak au poivre style. And then once we pull it out, salt it up and eat it, man, by all means. So batch processing, by the way, speaking of, yes, question or DG? Brine the meat before sous viding it? Ooh, like, like a wet brine? Ooh, I've never done that. Now I'm gonna. Want a cheat code? What's a cheat code? Ah, uh, yes. So this is mentioning how if you're doing what's called the immersion method of that you just take a Ziploc bag, slip it down in the water with just the lip above, it'll kind of push the air out. I do that with a cocktail straw to kind of like, like back when you were sealing up bags of weed in college, you like draw the air out of it. And so, yeah, if you don't have a proper vacuum sealer, um, oil can go in the bag. Oil or any kind of fat, frankly, will do a lot of good thermal conductive work, but it won't water down the meat. So that's a, that's a good cheat code for that. You liked walnut oil, right? You like walnut oil in the bag, you said? Salt, pepper, walnut oil, that's it. No other herbs in the bag. Comes out good? Yeah. The Searsol is very controllable. So you're going to, this hardware that you hear us using up here with the blowtorch, we'll talk about that too. If you don't have a full stove, there's a lot of ways to handle this. So something neat about sous vide, like if I batch process a ton of prepped meat, when I want to cook it, I don't have to fuck around and let it defrost. You bring your sous vide out, you take it out of the freezer, blam, right into the freaking sous vide, it's fine. It'll just slowly come up to temperature and it's not gonna overshoot. So it's super convenient. Now we pointed out, right, you're cooking the meat. The chemical reaction of cooking is occurring. But when you pull it out, you've got this pink meat, which is not what you're usually like associating with, ooh, that's tasty. So browning the meat, you do need a very high temperature hit on meat or on a number of products to create what is called a Maillard reaction. Science to this day still has not fully untangled all the little details that go into a Maillard reaction, a browning reaction. But it is, this, is, this is what happens with proteins and some sugars. Like have you ever made baked goods and they say brush uh, egg yolk on it or egg, brush eggs before you put it in the oven because it's going to brown. It's literally the protein from the egg that's Maillarding. The Maillard reaction is built into our collective DNA and our evolutionary response to food. We are the only creature that responds to like cooking because we are like a dog doesn't give a shit if a steak is raw or cooked. Human beings over time, we have learned like here's a tray of meatballs at the Sky Club, right? Let's, let's look at this little zoom in area. If you could only have meatball A or B, which one would you want? <laughs> You're going to want meatball B. Because in the back of your mind, everything in our evolutionary history is telling you that this is cooked and safe and nutritious. That is the reaction that your taste buds are giving you because something has been browned. That is the Maillard reaction. You can do it in the pan, uh, cast iron all day long, not just for, for specific heat, but actually for heat emissivity. Cast iron is going to get you the best hit of heat. You want as much heat as you can into your meat so you're not cooking through. You just want to brown that surface. That'll work fine. Can you get me a plate? Usually you want a little bit of uh, fat in the pan when you do that. There, there are some options for your fat in the pan. We can talk about that. All right, one Prodigy fan, there you go. So a lot of different oils and fats you can use as you're trying to get that crust, that outside sear. These are kind of what it comes down to for me, although now because you told me I'm going to try, I'm going to walnut oil it up one of these times. You don't want your oil or fat to breach what's called a smoke temperature. If you hit a smoke point, you are going to change the taste of what you're using. And we're actually, if you want to get all like chemistry hippie about it, oh, free radicals. And allegedly it is less healthy to smoke off your oil or your fat. So higher temperature things, higher temperature oils that aren't going to hit a heavy flavor are what most people go for. Um, frankly, like this is, this, is the, this is what's standard in our kitchen at home. This is what we're going to reach for depending on what we're making. So on the low end, like you can get canola oil. Canola oil is a very neutral flavor. It's stupid cheap. And it's going to work pretty damn well. Avocado oil or something is going to be very high smoke point, but it's got a very strong flavor. You might not want that. In general, the less that is in your oil, so like extra virgin olive oil, super raw olive oil, has got a low smoke point, very strong flavor. You're not going to see people like that on their steak usually. The more you clarify out 
the other proteins out of an oil. So you've got like light oil, refined oil, extra light olive oil. It's going to raise the, the smoke point, and it's going to taste like, like less pronounced. What we're using here for everything, we just have this little Tupperware tin. It's just G. It's just clarified butter made from the Kerrygold. And it's going to be nutty and creamy and insanely good smoke point. Very expensive if you buy it in a store, but you can make your own. Now, we have a stove here, right? What if you, you want to travel, you want to use a stove, but you're in a hotel room. You need a stove. Oh, hacks. No, don't, don't actually do that. I don't recommend this at all. Yeah, like literally stove tops are stupid cheap. You can travel with an induction cooktop. That's, that's what we have going on over here. We can, we can give you some, some footage going on. Woo! So Dr. Tran is doing both sides of the tri-tip as, as he's rolling. He's using the blowtorch on top of the cast iron, which is sitting on top of a little induction cooktop. Induction cooking is really cool. It's you're essentially, and someone who's like an EE is going to correct me, you're fluctuating magnetic fields in the, the ferrous metal. You're actually stressing the metal at a molecular level and causing it to heat up. So cast iron that I travel with always is going to get stupid hot immediately. It works really well. And if you have a co stove, you can do like vegetables. You can brown them up nicely. You can, again, like this was a steak in a hotel room in South Dakota, sitting there with some people at a con, and I was like, hey, who wants meat? Because made that in two minutes. For finishing, if you don't want to travel with a stove and a pan and everything else, you can just use this flamethrower that we got up here, right? <laughs> Not an actual like proper flamethrower, you, you want to use a little blowtorch. So what we have, the, this is called a Searzall. A Searzall is an adapter that fits on a small home propane torch. And it's a, just a big bell jar sort of head, it's just bell engine head. <laughs> It just spreads the flame, and it's like you're painting a sear right across the meat. It's really fun to use. Uh, it, it just looks badass as hell. It's also just it's sitting on our kitchen counter all the time. So it'll melt. You know, oh, i got to melt this cheese. Like, bam. It's just all. Vis, do you keep yours out all the time? Yeah, I don't use that. It's the only way I can grill the cheese. That's how he makes all his grilled cheese, he says. So, yeah, like, <laughs> it's, it's so fun to fucking use. And it, it looks, it, it does look pretty fucking tight. Like, Tran looks like a badass up here. Uh, especially at night if you're out like camping. This was at tour camp and such. So yeah, uh, it is hot. It is a giant open flame. So it stays hot after you've used it. Don't touch it. You will burn your hands. Uh, but also like be mindful of what you're cooking over. So like don't be over a paper plate on top of a wooden table. Like everything in this photo is wrong. Nothing should be happening here. Yeah, rig up some kind of safe surface that you can, that can use, you know, uh, it will get smoky. Being outside is helpful. I'm really thrilled. We haven't said anything off in here yet. Being outside is good. We've, like, hung out of hotel windows before, just kind of, you know. But sometimes, like, you just say, fuck it. Like, whatever. My room's going to be smoky. My room's going to be smoky. I have had many good smelling hotel rooms. Invariably, everyone asks the question, how the fuck do you not get in trouble for this? And the answer is, every hotel, big, small, and in between, will give you free shower caps. <laughs> yeah. Hacks. Yeah, take that off before the maid comes in the room. Uh, the only disadvantage, frankly, to a Searzall is uh, throughput. It's not as fast as just using a cast iron, but you can do a lot with it. You can even see what we're doing here. This is clearly completely uncooked meat. Why are we searing it? This is the pre-sear technique. It's like double Maillard reaction. You do a sear on the meat when it's cold, so it's not going to cook through. Then that Maillard protein, that taste flavor, gets imbued into the whole steak. You pull it out. And all you do is wake it back up again with a quick sear on the outside to get that crisp surface. If you're doing a huge party, like I really do recommend a uh, pan, like a cast iron, just for, again, for th throughput. Yeah, I do want to add, if you like your steaks uh, Pittsburgh style with a crust on it, the sears all is not going to get hot enough. You will need a cast iron pan. So there's something else to consider depending on how you like it. I mentioned hotel staff before. If you're in like a shitball Airbnb, no one's coming in, whatever. If you're in a nice hotel, like, I think this is the Westin or something, and, like, it looks weird. Put that away before the maid gets in the room. Just be aware of that. TSA doesn't know what this is either. Um, you can't travel with the gas bottle. You can travel with the burn torch head as long as, you know, the valve's open. But, uh, yeah, like, be, be prepared to answer some questions. And when you get to your destination, just find the gas. Every crappy store should have this, like... A bunch of stores that even think they don't, a lot of times it's there, it's near the charcoal, like you'll find it at a Ralph's or a Target or what have you. So yeah, this is, this, is really, this is really fun stuff without bringing a lot of hassle. I bring some other gear. So I have this little silver Peli case, right? It's part of my usual luggage complement. This is my road kitchen. My little Peli case 
has everything I pretty much need. And it's just, it all Tetris is in. I keep my Nova with me. I have, you know, the, the, the torch head. I have the TS-8000. I have a cast iron with me at all times now. Um, yeah, some cutting boards, some, you know, some knives and things that you don't want to have to buy each time. Yeah, what you got? It's 12 o'clock. It is technically lunchtime. You're welcome to keep going until 1 if you really want. Um, we won't take you all the way. We'll let you do a real lunch. Yeah, yeah, it is 12 if you had, like, a lunch date that you had to get to. But I'm just going to keep feeding you. So how many people are enjoying this so far? Sweet! Woo! Yeah, tongs and things, you know, just stuff you don't want to keep rebuying that just fits in my bag. Yes, sir? Oh, well, that's kind of cool. Instead of going to the grocery store and, like, and you're on the plane, could you like Amazon Prime Now or Amazon Pantry like to the hotel? I am fucking going to do that because that would just be even funnier. <laughs> that's awesome. Confuse the heck out of the front desk. Yes? Sorry. Why don't you use camping gear? Why don't I use camping gear is the question. Um, because when I first started doing this, I just took the shit out of my kitchen. And then now it just lives in this road kit. And uh, yeah, for the most part, it's the, the, the camping gear, like you might be thinking of, like a green pan, like green copper or something, like a lighter weight pan maybe. Um, the, light, the copper pan wouldn't work on my induction cooktop. I love the cast iron for that. I also love that the cast iron is just effing un undestroyable. Like you can, you literally can clean it anywhere. You just burn it off and reseason it. I've really smoked out my hotel rooms doing that. But yeah, I'm sure there's probably some better uh, knives or tongs or other things that would be more compact. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the more thermal mass you have is going to be is going to you know send more meat more more heat into the meat. I have a little travel spice rack that I that I roll with now. This was actually a bitters kit that Larry Pesci from Paul.com made me, and all the bitters live at my house now, but I use the, the little binders to like travel with all of my, because I hate buying like a giant sucker of sea salt and then like wasting it every time. So, you know, I do have, that's, that's getting a little bit nuts with the, the road spice kit. I have some oils and things, because I'm not going to find like weird, you know, crazy macadamia nut oil or something at every shitty grocery store. The most fun thing, because I host a lot of parties like at my hotel or at my Airbnb a lot, the best thing I bought was an LED light bulb. And the reason is, like, I'm down in some, you know, city in Nicholasville, Kentucky, like I'm out at Lockmasters or something, and I spread a bunch of, you know, all right, gonna get this food going on, gonna have everyone from class come over. And you try to, like, tell people where it is, and it's like, no one's from this town, no one knows this neighborhood. I'm just like, yeah, get on the street, it's the house with the green porch light. So many times, everyone has found Dave's house with the green porch light, and it's, yeah, it's giving you, giving you little tips here. In general, don't be afraid to do this. Like, the principles overall are not, com we did a bunch of crazy stuff up here. How many people have had some, oh, there's piles of steak. Oh yeah, there's, we're gonna start sending that around again soon. You guys still have your plates? All right, we're gonna start walking some steak down these aisles if we can, please. Oh, we're, oh, you should come up, start coming up and start plating this if you want. So in general, this is your shopping list. It's gonna be online. It's gonna look better on the video capture. You can, you can get a set of equipment that you roll with and like, maybe you'll be like me, maybe you have a little suitcase or maybe you just have a small bag inside of your luggage. But ultimately, here, keep the projector a little clear as you're standing there. Ultimately, I want you people not just to try this here, I want you to try this at home. Food and food hacking and getting better at food is literally a game with infinite continues. Every time it's a new attempt, every time it's a chance to get better. You take notes, you learn what you did, and you're like, oh, that was awesome, I gotta repeat that the next time, or oh, maybe I'll season it a little differently this time. You have a chance to get better every single time, and it's not hard, and it's not something you should be afraid of. You should all try this. There are a billion awesome resources online now. So like Chef Steps, the company who makes the jewel, they have a ton of beautiful visual guides. Uh, Serious Eats is a website that has like the Food Lab, is, is a very well-known site. Uh, these are not, these are not insurmountable challenges. Every one of you can eat like this, and every one of you can try to do this, and I hope that you will try it. I hope you enjoyed yourself here. Did you enjoy yourself, Trent? Oh, yeah. Yes. Who, who, who had a good time here? Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Come have food and ask questions. While we're in line, we can just keep doing questions while we're here. What's up? Yes, sir, I see you. Where do I source my bitters? Where do I source my bitters? Uh, pretty much Amazon. Um, Fee Brothers is a company that makes a lot of nice uh, bitters. There's some other boutique -y ones. 
Uh, orange bitters, I really like Reagan's orange bitters uh, for when I'm doing like a, a certain kind of old fashioned that I use orange bitters in. But yeah, Fee Brothers, Black Walnut Fee Brothers bitters for when I make an old fashioned, like all the, oh yeah. Yes, sir. What about traveling with alcohol? So, um, you're, if you're flying, traveling with alcohol, you're going to bump into the TSA's kind of thing. Although it's really funny, uh, if you like, know anybody who makes stickers, like I want, I want hacker stickers or somebody to make a run of little dot stickers that just say TSA three ounce certified, and just put it on anything, like put it on like a flask that's this big, and just see if they buy it. <laughs> but for the most part, no. If you're flying, uh, I'm going to have a lot of my bigger bottles in check bags, and I use those Vivino Lock, you know, Vino Lock or uh, Wine Wings bags. And I'll, I'll put like, I'll usually roll into town with like a couple of bottles of whiskey just you, because I don't know what they're going to have at the local store. Hey, Scorch. Keep some in a that pinch? for Dave and I and, you, and yourself. You get the little that cut. That's cool. So he says a lot of liquor stores will have either smaller bottles or they will have just like small flasks or things you mean? Yeah. Uh, Would you say I shop bottles or shot bottles? And, and yourself if you don't have one yet. Oh, so yeah, buy a bunch of cocktail bottles and fill a TSA legal plastic bag. You can, yes. Although some airlines don't like it when you have your own liquor because technically they have a liquor license and it's allegedly not allowed. So like always order one of the thing you have a bunch of and then just like, it's like Zeus and the magic goblet. It just keeps refilling itself. I don't know. Amazing. Yes, anyone else? Who is going to try the little egg, uh, like the egg experiment? Once everyone gets all this meat, what we're going to do is we're going to have everyone with your cups. We're going to spread out all of the toppings. We have tons of shredded cheese. We have bacon bits. We have the, the mushrooms left over, some greens. Everyone's going to prepare their cup. We're going to pour the egg mixtures into the cup. I think that just came up to temperature, didn't it? That just did. So in, we're going to slowly wheel this over to the chill-out area, and that's where we will keep your little egg cups. Come into the chill-out room in 90 minutes after they've been in. They'll all be ready to rock keep your forks or get a new one, and I, I really want to know how the little flan egg desserts worked out for you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Has the hotel ever accused you of smoking in a room? Has the hotel <laughs> ever accused me of smoking in a room? No, fortunately. Uh, because nothing, like, cigarettes smell like cigarettes, right? Meat just smells like meat. One time, the hotel was like, yeah, we had a, like, a, there was like a question, what was going on in your room? I was like, oh, I came back from, the, it was in Austin. I was like, oh, I brought a bunch of barbecue back to my room. Must, it must just be hanging in the air. And I'm like, you know, kicking this trash. My trash cans look freaking weird sometimes. I, I haul trash out of the rooms and throw it out in like by the ice machine. Because yeah, I should have put in some pictures of our trash can in this room. It's just covered with like mushroom stems and like meat styrofoam containers and yeah. Anyone else? Who thinks they might, who does not yet own a sous vide but now thinks they might want to buy one? I get a lot of tweets after this. I gave this talk once before at CarolinaCon, a, pre, a preliminary version of it, and like three or four people literally were showing me photos the next week in their kitchen. And I love that. I love that people are trying stuff that's new. And think of it that way. Think of it as you can always try to be better. It's, it, it, I love that infinite continues my idea. And also that time uh, Anova tweeted to you because of that. Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're gonna, once this talk goes online, Anova Culinary, like Anova is on Twitter. Everyone should be mentioning Anova. If you took photos here, like definitely they'll get a kick out of that. Anyone else? How we, yes, yes. What, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being here. If you, if, uh, some people had to leave, but yeah. You had a question. Okay. So like doing a manual, so yeah, you can manually do a water bath process, as the gentleman says. You can just, if you're monitoring the temperature of the water, and you're, it helps if you agitate it a little bit, but water is good at self-regulating itself, you know. If you just check your stove out and kind of touch it up, touch it down, the bigger your water vessel, the better that's going to withstand, the, it's going to withstand those swings. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the most unfuck upable way of cooking. How much steak we got left? Oh, we still got a lot of steak going on. Is this ours? Can I have some? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right. Oh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, you're saying a, a cast iron with a contoured surface? So will a cast iron still brown effectively if it is not a flat bottom? It will brown less effectively because you're getting less direct contact into the meat. 
but I think, again, when you, the meat comes out so tender, I bet it's going to make good yeah, content. Yeah, I think it depends on the cut of meat, how soft it is, um, and also how, how tall the contours are. Uh, I usually avoid those types of pans because I like the flat surface area. Because even when it's flat, sometimes the moisture escaping will create little air pockets. You, you'll notice that's not perfectly, there'll be little spots of not brown. So the flatter, the better. Mm -hmm. Who's going to do the egg thing, by the way? Everyone with your cup? That's not a lot of hands. A lot of you took cups. As soon as this meat line finishes, we're going to clear this out and put the, uh, it's going to be like a little toppings bar. We're going to make this work. You got a cup? Oh, yeah, man. AV man's got a cup. Sweet. Yes, sir. Way to rock it. Everyone put your name on your cups or else we will not know whose it is. There are markers that we're going around. Can we all please thank uh, DG for having faith in me to not burn the building down and let me do this? <laughs> He says it can't be any worse than what his own staff and he does to this hotel, right? No, that's not on camera. We didn't just say that. Who likes this hotel? I, I've actually, for all the fact that we ruffle some feathers, they've been kind of good to us. Yeah, we're pretty done up there, I think. Sure, sure. Yeah, I like, do you think we'll be here next year? Do we know? As long as it's great for, for us, DG says he's happy, so yeah. I have, I have, I've been enjoying food with this guy in various hotel rooms and, and his apartment for a very long time, and it has seriously upped my game. <laughs> Fuck carbs. No, no pasta. I will have edamame pasta, which as, a, as an Italian you will not allow. You are okay with that? All right. Dr. Tran, any other thoughts? What are some of your favorite things that you, you did something with salmon, right? Yeah, so cooking fish is actually something very nice with sous vide because it's very easy to overcook fish, but with sous vide, it's impossible to overcook fish. So something else to keep in mind. I mean, my favorite recipe is uh, salmon with mustard seeds and mustard oil. Um, it's an Indian recipe, actually, but it's, it's really good. Uh, I don't know. Are you taking pictures of the food? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think fish is something else. If you like seafood, uh, also lobster tail. You can't overcook lobster tail, sous vide cooking. Yeah, yeah. Think it's, it's the perfect way to handle food that's like expensive, stuff you don't want to screw up because it costs you money. You're like, oh, yeah. oh nice shirt, solid, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, sir. The cheese is uh, manchego cheese, so that's going to be a sheep's milk cheese. Is sheep or goat? In sheep. sheep, yeah. Um, I really like uh, goat and sheep cheese a lot of the time. Uh, but yeah, manchego is one of my top like three go-to cheeses. You really want to have a party, bring your cheese out of the fridge long before your guests arrive. Let it get up to temp. It's going to be creamier. It's going to taste better. Yes, sir. So that's an interesting question. And for me, no. But I want to hear about other people here. The question was, have I ever done ribs? Um, I, like, I, I like when people smoke ribs to get that bark and everything. So I've never personally tried it in my sous vide. But it looks like I saw some hand. Have you? And you have? How did it go? It came out great. Yeah. 145 for 9 to 12 hours. 145 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you're still doing the, the, brown, the, the, the crusting process, just much, it, you've, you've sped up the, the smoking. Yeah, I've, I've browned things like that in the broiler. Mm -hmm. So I've done um, a pork belly uh, for four, 36 hours in the sous vide cooker. Then I put it under the broiler, under high, and that creates the crispiness on mm -hmm. the skin. Yeah, that's how Mitch did that standing rib roast. That there was like a, an herb crust, and then he, we threw it in the oven at the end. And yes, sir. Yes. So the question, he's, he's saying, we're throwing out cook time numbers, like 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. Um, you definitely don't have to do that. Most of the time when I'm having uh, sous vide meat, like, it's going to be 90 minutes to two hours, depending on how thick the steak is. I don't and that's that. Enough. My minimum is 24 hours. Well, once you've tried it, you know, it will be different. In fact, the, the food lab has a web, it have the photos on the web of, like, this is, this is the meat at different temperatures, and you really see it. It starts really breaking down and denaturing all the proteins. It's incredibly tender. But you don't have to do that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's doing its own thing. It's just sitting there. Those are the ribs. Ooh, god damn. Man, that's, that is freaking gorgeous. All right, the meat line is coming along pretty well. I'll get mine in a minute. I'll get mine in a minute. How's the, how's the steak going? Give it, what's up? How we doing there? Is it good? 
We're almost out. We're almost out. Good. That's what we wanted to do. As soon as the steak is done, we're, this is pacing perfectly. Look at this. We're going to have just enough. As soon as the steak is done, we're going to move things around, and you're going to do your egg cup stuff. Is there more? Oh, I'd love a piece of cheese. Is there more cheese? Is that? Oh, that's all right. You have it. You have it, brother. Damn. What's the, um, here, tell people what you do put to the ribs when you do that. So for a smoking St. Louis, or sous vide, yeah, sorry, sous vide St. Louis ribs, did a dry rub to begin with, vacuum sealed them, let them sit there overnight. At room temperature? Uh, in the fridge. In the fridge. Let them come up to temperature for about 45 minutes, mm -hmm. put them in the sous vide for 9 to 12 hours at 145 Fahrenheit, pull them out, pat them dry, throw them on the smoker, anywhere between about 400 and 450 for 20 to 25 minutes total. Nice. What kind of smoker? Uh, Traeger. Okay. Kenji Lopez, who's that? Is that a website? Oh, Siri. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he has a recipe for ribs. Okay. I've been reading the freaking guy's website. I don't know his name. Shit. All right. Last of the meat is happening, and then um, a couple of my helper staff. Can we look into this box? We're going to spread out the cheese. We're going to spread out the bacon bits, just uh, and let people start. We'll make another line with your um, with your glass jars. We're going to make the egg jars happen. as the egg uh, container. Okay, that'll be right at the end. Yeah, yeah. It'll be right behind, right? You'll be the first one in line. Yeah. So we have our uh, target bags. Those are the trash bags. We'll just dump all of the... Uh, oh, is there more wine? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, wine for you. Not a lot of people took free wine, man. It's t is it too early in the day for you fucking people to be drinking? Yes, sir, what's your question? I don't know what that is, and I want you to tell me what that is. Well, a cool hand pan is a, a frying pan that's made to be very light. It's got a stamped handle. It's all hollow and everything, and it doesn't, it doesn't carry the heat very far because it doesn't have much thermal mass. So it wouldn't be like having a heavy pan and carrying a lot of heat through, but just a variation. I have never tried that. Um, I, I will check one out, maybe. I love, I, it's not just the thermal coefficient of cast iron that really blows it away. It's, it's what's called emissivity, how fast it gets the heat out of itself. That, uh, that really gets that browning rack. So I've never tried that before. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah. Right. No, you really want it to be as smooth as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reseasoning it. Yeah. I will mention that. So Duldi mentioned that, and this is actually it's interesting. So Lodge is the brand of like American cast iron. That's Lodge has been our in our country's DNA, right? Long ago, cast iron pans had a much better like process for finishing and for making them they were they were polished down the modern ones have like a pebbly finish they have a pebbly surface but he said what did you use to to grind it out like a steel wire polish it's just okay so you just so he actually ground out his his finish to get to that flat the flatter surface the better and then he just reseat because yeah seasoning a cast iron all you're doing is polymerizing a layer of oil onto it. So at the molecular level, oil just gets embedded into the surface. You had a question, yes. Uh, no, I am not. In, I am a Philadelphian living in Montana, then Seattle. So now I live, when I'm home, I'm in Seattle, but I really live in seat 2A. I, not on me, but my, my Twitter is just DV and Olaf on Twitter, so D-E-V. Uh, yeah, uh, deviant, uh, deviating.net is uh, also going to work. 
deviant at deviating.net. Dot net. Deviating dot net. D E V I A T I N G. Yes, deviating dot net. And I promise these slides will wind up on deviating dot net very soon. Say that again, sir. <laughs> I don't know, we'll see. So yes, if you are oh yeah, put these uh, put the herbs up here too. Oh you got some good, good, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we got the egg line coming up. Seasonings are good. The egg mixture already has salt and pepper, but thyme, oh boy, I recommend some shakes of thyme. Thyme goes very well with eggs. Uh, we have some little chives, hot sauces. You can put a couple of hot sauce. Here, you can put that next to the other one there, even though green hot sauce is the way to go with eggs. Yeah, by all means, get about a third of the way in your jar with all of your seasonings and toppings, and then we've got this big blue picnic container thing. You're just going to egg mixture almost to the top, about till about half inch to the top. And then when you tighten your lid, finger tight. You're not torque wrenching it. Finger tight. Question. How do I peel my eggs? Excellent question, because god damn, that sucks a lot when you're trying to make hard boiled eggs. The best trick you can do, and Serious Eats, like they did a whole article about this, about the right way to do The best thing is use slightly older eggs, if you can. Eggs that are a week old, they're gonna, they're gonna pop out much better. Nowadays though, the real hotness, like right after everyone's buying their Anovas, there's something called an Instapot. It's like a modern pressure cooker, like pressure cookers, not just for terrorists anymore. Uh, the Instapot is like a, a heat pressure steam process and people say that the eggs practically leap out of their shells once they come out. Pork shoulder in Instapot? Yes, sir. Baking soda, so changing the pH of the water, baking soda or vinegar, people talk about that. Um, but I really liked um, the Food Lab's breakdown of like every possible tip and which worked and which didn't. And in the end, it turns out the Instapot or any steaming method, a lot of people really liked that. Yes, sir. Carbon steel for what? Um, I've only ever used cast iron. Carbon steel would work. You know. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, and if it's steel, it would, um, it, most of the time it will work with the induction cooktop too. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder, be responsible, throw away all the trash, all the plates and everything, because we're not supposed to be eating in here, I think. So it looks like we're getting ready. Oh, you're even dicing up the onions and everything. You guys rock! Oh my, can I please have a huge hand for my helpers from everyone from Scorch, Geo, Sunshine. Thank you so much. I just like pressed them into service on this one. Love you both, love you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And definitely, if you got like, I was up here, I couldn't see all the fun. If you got pictures of anything, like please tweet at me. I wanna see how this, how this looked. So yeah, throw, throw shit at me on Twitter. Almost ready to roll? Almost, it's okay. I am so thrilled that everyone stuck around. You, you enjoyed this? Really, this was cool. Yes, sir, I see a hand. Um, were there any concerns about the plastic container leaching anything? Excellent question, I should have uh, pointed that out. So the gentleman says, with the higher temperatures you're running, especially like veggies, right? is there concerns about plastic deformation? There's two types of concerns. The vessel in which you're working. I've seen like Rubbermaid vessels start to really deform and like they, they have some trouble with that hot water. That's why I like the cooler. But I think more to your point, you're thinking about the, the container vessel. Um, when you buy Ziploc bags, buy freezer bags. Freezer bags have a much, uh, they're usually more mils thick, they have a better seal, um, yeah. If you're using like the food saver bags, which by the way, if you have a food saver, don't buy food saver bags. Like, uh, that's the, it's like the ink cartridge model of fucking pricing. Uh, go on Amazon, look for food vac bags, and it's like the same company that's made it's for like pennies on the bag. Uh, food saver bags are gonna withstand anything. But if you're using just Ziplocs, freezer grade, freezer grade bags. Almost ready to rock. I think we're there. Yeah. 
So we're going to let the egg cups train commence little by little. The slowest point in this process will be filling it up at the end station. The egg mixture does have salt and pepper in it. Uh, that says psychoholics in, in Russian. What was that? What we can do is we can stop this right now and just lift the, lift the lid so they can, they can drop right in there. Uh, do we have tongs? Let's clean off one of the, clean one set of tongs so we can lower that in there. So we're not going to put an artificial limit on when these egg cups are done. Like, I'm going to be in the chill-out area for most of this con. If you left your egg cups after closing, we're eating them. <laughs> Come back and get them when they're done. Mm -hmm. We're going to let this line go through. Remember, we're going to be in the chill-out room. Once everything is done, we're going to get all this gear upstairs. The, the cooking is going to be in the chill-out room. Please come by. Please try your eggs when they're done because I really think you'll like them. And, yeah, thank you so much for listening. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys.